Welcome back to Trending in Education. Uh, very pleased and excited to have a friend of the show, three-time uh, appearance person for the show, Angela Seifer, the executive director of the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. Angela, welcome back to Trending in Education. Thank you, Mike. I'm super excited to be with you again. I was mentioning when we were prepping briefly that our previous episode is both among the most downloaded shows ever of Trending in Education and also one of the shortest shows ever of Trending in Education. So I think that's a credit. I say that's, that's you making the most of your time. But, but last time we, we, we caught up was, I think like maybe the third week of March. It was like right in the thick of the initial hitting of, of the coronavirus of COVID-19 in the US. And we were talking about how your organization, uh, which focuses on digital inclusion, was now facing new challenges. And then it feels like a world's worth of time has passed between then and now. Um, I hear you may be the hardest working person in honor of Regis Philbin. You're the hardest working person in digital inclusion in the U.S. But like, what's it been like, you know, since then? It's just such a such a wild ride, I imagine. It has been a wild ride. I think it depends on if you're asking my nice, polite self or if you're asking my, I don't know, snarky self. <laughs> mm, mm. Yeah, right. we have time. We, we're going to go longer than the last episode. So we could, we could, I'm asking for whatever perspective you think would help. Well, for entertainment purposes, yeah. the snarky self is like, oh, people finally realize there's a digital divide. Yeah. <laughs> right. But that is, that is pretty snarky. Yeah. So, um, the more respectful answer that I usually give is there's just more awareness yeah. now, right? right? And so my days used to include answering the question, why is the internet important? Mm -hmm. Particularly with media, I don't really get asked that. I did yep. get asked that once a couple of weeks ago and I did get snarky. Yeah. <laughs> because really, but right. people know asking the question is just silly because right. everybody already, you, you, anybody can answer that question right now. Mm -hmm. I think the specifics of it we can get into, but that also gets into solutions. Mm -hmm. And in this moment in time, anyone who's working on the digital divide is swamped because right. they got they got to come up with solutions like right. yesterday. Right, right. And and time is of the essence, right? So it's not about the you know the whole perfect is the enemy of the good. Like you just have to get something right. viable out there. Because as we talked about last time, you know, lives are on the line too. So like, it's not just that awareness of the problem yeah. has been elevated, but also the, the urgency of, you know, enabling seniors, enabling people, you know, in, in poverty, you know, people who are far from a hospital or like, there's, there's plenty of rural, poor, there, there's plenty of contexts. You know, I've thought often about our conversation just because of the breadth of what digital inclusion is actually looking at. Because I remember that from our previous conversation. You know, I think a lot of what I think about is the schools and right. kids. And, you know, like we've talked a lot about how there are gaps, you know, opportunity gaps, you know, achievement gaps, you know, which, you know, we may or may not, however you want to label it, there, there are inequities. People are coming into things in diff at different levels um, in the K-12 space. But it seems like, you know, I'm more curious just really across the full range of, of context that you have out there. Can you just explore some of that with us? Because it just seems yeah, yeah, of course. the scope is just enormous. I, the, it's the K-12 that did the awareness building. Yeah, yeah. Really. That's what, that was really when it became so obvious that kids couldn't do their homework. Mm -hmm. That that was a great awakening. Like, yeah, oh, yeah. you mean they don't have internet at home like I do? <laughs> Like right. that, that's really what happened. Yeah. And then in the course of that is how we get to all the other populations. Right. right? So in the course right. of that, it helps us then widen that to any low income family, right. really. Adult right. or child. So if the child doesn't have it, parent doesn't have it either. Right. Or the parent has a tiny bit on their phone and they save it for emergencies. Right. Not for, you know, day to day kind of stuff like those of us who do have it would be using it for. Yeah. And then for the dis anyone who has disabilities, mm -hmm. the the older Americans, yeah. it becomes an issue of safety. Exactly. Because if they can't stay in their homes, 
right. then they're putting themselves at risk of mm-hmm. the virus. And then as a community, with all of us needing to stay home, right. we're putting each other at risk right. if we can't stay home. Right. And so the, I think it's that, that awareness and that being honest if you didn't have broadband, would you stay at home? Mm-hmm. Right. It's interesting. It reminds me a little bit of some of the conversations about Black Lives Matter and white privilege and um, colorblind. You know, I don't see race. I think there's a very more, even more subtle thing. It's like, I don't see digital inequity. That seems almost even more easy to fall prey to. If you just grow up connected yeah. to all this stuff, it seems like a pretty natural, you don't want to necessarily shame the person for not being aware of the thing. Right. Because it's not in their world. Right. right? So we all, and this is true for all of us, mm-hmm. what we know is reality is what's around us. Right. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing where if you're not speaking to people of color and understanding the struggles that they have gone through, then of course you're not going to under- understand yeah. this bigger issue, the right. racial equity issues. Right. And if you're not talking to people who don't have access to the internet or mm-hmm. hearing about their stories, then of course that's not part of your reality. So then right, those right. who are on in decision making positions, mm-hmm. so say here's here's an example where uh, you run a government agency or a social service agency or even a business, and you're like, okay, this is gonna save us money to switch everything to go online. Mm-hmm. Now we're gonna get rid of our phone support, we're gonna get rid of that in-person office where folks show up, and we're gonna it's gonna save us a lot because then because those things are expensive. Right, right. Uh, but then there's people who can't access those services, mm-hmm. whether they're business services or government or social services. And if the, if it hasn't occurred to that person in that decision-making role, mm-hmm. then of course they're going to think, well, it's just a good, it's just a good decision. Right. It's like a good business decision. Right. There's right. No, there's no malice there. Right. They're not right. intentionally leaving people out. Yeah. Well, what one would assume. Well, which is why the way in which you have to elevate awareness seems similar that way too, where you have to expose people's own limited view to actually educate them. For people to actually learn, we have, we have to get them to stop thinking in the more sort of narrow, sort of filtered way. You know, like just if you're only seeking people who think like you and come from your background, you will, you'll underestimate or be unaware of this problem but I think increasingly everyone is, is being put into a different context. You know, like everyone is being forced to face the, the challenges of sheltering at home and, you know, having to be put in the same context as everyone, I think is an opportunity to, to sort of reach out and find that empathy in, in just about anyone, especially if you can tell the stories from the perspective of the people who need access. And I think you're right that the, the K-12 story was kind of the, it's still, I mean, right through the fall, it's going to be the main story. How do you get people who, who may not be aware of the digital divide to understand that, that it's both important and that they maybe were blithely unaware of it prior? Like, it does seem like there's, there's an element of this that is, it's almost like you have to lead with empathy and try to understand even from their perspective that, to your point, like there's no malice there. Let, let's talk about it from the side of where the solutions are coming from. Mm-hmm. The solutions that are getting at that. Mm-hmm. And in some communities, there are community-wide solutions where they are addressing home connectivity for low-income families. They're addressing not just students, but additional populations that are at risk. And it is coming from these places where it's not just the school district doing it. It's the local government, it's local foundations, it's local businesses, sometimes it's a chamber of commerce. Mm-hmm. And then and then this is where the, the understanding was happening on the ground part comes in. It's the community-based organizations that already interact with our at most at-risk populations on right. a regular basis. Yep. So they know what's happening because they're all that is that is who they spend time with. Right, right. And so in the efforts where those organizations aren't included, that's where you see really limited Mm -hmm. solutions. And I think that's what we saw happen in the spring, Mm -hmm. where it was quick, just throw a bunch of devices out there, throw Uh some hotspots at them. And then the result was in some districts, they had a bunch of hotspots that just weren't weren't turned on. Yeah, yeah. Well, Well, why weren't they turned on? There are efforts going on right now in a couple of places to figure out what exactly happened in the spring. Mm-hmm. And 
part of, of the solution that NDIA is, is, has been recommending has been you have to have those community-based organizations engage from the beginning. Right. And so one of the models that's out there that we're really excited about is Chicago. Mm-hmm. So Chicago um, had announced a $50 million plan. It's for four years. They're not looking short-term. They're looking, yeah. in fact, the, short, the four years is just the initial plan. They're looking way beyond the four mm-hmm. years. because They recognize this is not just a pandemic problem. Yeah. The pandemic just drew attention to it. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. But inside that 50 million is 4 million for community-based organizations to be that those people hand-holding. Mm-hmm. Reach out to the families who are eligible. Because if you get told you're going to get free Comcast internet, do, do, it kind of sounds scammy, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. They're like, uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> right. Yeah. And then, and then I'm going to get some great big bill the next month. Right. No totally. thanks. Yeah. Uh, don't sign me up for that. Mm-hmm. So this way they have the trusted institution that's saying, yes, this is legit. Mm-hmm. School district is working on it. The city's in on it. Yep. Um, here's, and then here's some tech support. Do mm-hmm. you, what, what do you need help with? Mm-hmm. Is Zoom confusing? Mm-hmm. Are you not really sure about security? Are you feeling unsafe on the internet? Because yeah. Your child knows more than you do. Right, right. And like, oh, that's an issue. Right. So to have that person that you can turn to in an entity that you already trusted, I think that's huge. And so we're yeah. seeing that in Chicago. We're seeing that in a few other places. Uh, and so that's the that's a point that we'd like to get out there a bit more. Yeah, makes sense. And and I think you know the looking back on the last three or four months, there's been a lot of talk about emergency remote teaching, and the idea that no one really was prepared for this, whether it's a, a community center that's trying to help folks with technology or whether it's a, you know, a K-12 teacher in rural America or, or urban America, wherever, but no one was really prepared. So we, we did as well as we could collectively to respond in March when there were like sudden cancellations, sudden moves online. I think we all are aware that, that a lot of folks got lost in the shuffle. A lot of, a lot of students didn't get access and we just lost touch with them. And now looking ahead to the fall, any anticipation of how things are changed? Because it does feel like, you know, I know from the way the instruction is designed and how you hybridize, how you think about the physical space that you're teaching in, all those things have, there's a little more time to be thoughtful when you have five or six months as opposed to a couple of days. So how are you how are you thinking about you know the the difference between whatever happened in the spring to what you're anticipating in the K-12 space in the fall? NDIA's affiliates are are mostly community-based organizations, libraries, local governments, housing mm-hmm. authorities. So mm-hmm. our affiliates aren't K-12. Mm-hmm. Our affiliates are the entities that partner with K-12. Got it. Yep. And so their experience is that some of them are having improved relationships with their k-12 partners because there's that recognition now that oh my gosh you guys understand technology yeah. um, so you're a valuable resource for us right but then also it is the there are more organizations out there who've had to move their programming online just as mm-hmm. you said it's not just the schools who've had to do this it's also yeah you know you were you were teaching meal prep right Right. Yeah. Uh, and so how, how right. are you, and you used to do it in person. Mm-hmm. You were, you were working with seniors to help them get into to different professions, right, right. To, to new jobs. And you were doing that in person. Yeah. We actually have one of our partners when they is a newer partner, when they had the switch, they were providing that service to seniors, helping them get into to new positions. When, when COVID hit, they tried to come up with a solution, found a lot of their seniors that they've been working with didn't have internet at home, didn't have a computer or didn't have digital skills, one of those three things. Yeah. And the only solution they could come up with was paper. Mm-hmm. They reverted to correspondence school. Wow. Wow. <laughs> right. Which is kind of mind blowing. It's kind of amazing. Yeah. You know, I, I, I almost want to see the, the course. It's like, it reminds me of the old civil war, you know, you know, dearest prudence, it's been fun. You know, it's like, how, what do you even do when you go correspondence? Like that's a whole, that's a whole other podcast. Yeah. 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 Totally. And so now we are now working with them because mm-hmm. they've gotten some grant funds yeah. to be able to, 
to set up the digital navigator model that NDIA has been working on with some of our other partners, which is that there's an individual who already works with the at-risk population and we cross train them. That makes sense. So the trainers that were already working with these seniors in person to help them develop new skills, that we would work with them so they would understand what are the low cost internet options in that person's area mm -hmm. um, for using grant funds to be able to buy them a computer or yep. a tablet. And then having that digital navigator be the person who says, okay, let's, let's get you to where you, you can take these online courses that we now have available. So yep. Yep. getting them to that point where they can take the online courses and we don't, that structure doesn't exist in the U S right now. Right. So for lots of us, if we have a tech problem, there's somebody we turn to. Sure. Right. I turn to my husband for certain yeah, things, yeah. Turn to colleagues or friends for other things. I'm right, the person right. some people turn to. Is that, I mean, that's one of the reasons why we, we have children, right? Eventually they <laughs> will be able to answer our tech support questions, you know? Yeah. Well, only if they've grown up with that tech. Good point. Right? See, that's me in my bubble. My bad. Yeah. Right. Because in a low income community, so my 10 year old has grown up with a computer. Mm -hmm. Other 10 year olds have not grown up with computers and right, maybe right, all right. they know is that mobile phone. Right. And so there's actually colleges have expressed an issue where they are coming across where kids coming into, into mm -hmm. the universities and the community colleges don't have typing skills. Right. Because they, they, they rarely can, they can, use a key, they can, they can thumb, thumb, thumb it, thumb type. Yeah. but they've rarely used a keyboard. Interesting. And so that's a digital skill. Mm-hmm. Right, and being able to ascertain um, what is real and what is not. Yeah. Whew, we all need that right now. Yeah, it's yeah. It's way confusing out there. And we don't have an ongoing way of helping everybody keep up with digital skills all the way through life because cause here's the super depressing part. We're never done. Yeah, I know. Yeah, or well, maybe that's hopeful, you know? That could be hopeful. Like if you love learning and you yeah. love staying, yeah. staying sharp, you know, there, there, there's a little bit of hope there. But uh, I love the idea of the, the digital navigator and, uh, you know, like that role being more based on the, the individual and the relationships that he or she may have rather than looking for tech skills and then sort of cross-training in the human emotional savvy, you know, tr trust building. Cause I feel like a lot of this has got to be about building trust. And when you That's only exactly have, right. and when you only have digital tools available to you, it's gotta be hard. So if there, if there are people who already are in the community, you know, I would think that would be a, a re and then, and then that's gotta be interesting too. Cause then your digital navigators tech profiles, must be kind of all over the place where some are probably <laughs> they, super they are savvy. all over the place yeah yeah, yeah that's fascinating yeah. so uh, that's that's been happening that's a model that's been out there it, it, over it's the a last model year. developing right now okay. so the way ndia has gone at it is that we have a couple of clients we're working with to develop the model with them sure. at the same time we are learning from our affiliates who are going down their own path mm -hmm. and figuring this out for themselves some of them call it different things it really yeah and it, they all slightly vary, but the basic idea is that there is somebody that you can turn to for these three components, the home access, the device, and the basic digital literacy. Yeah. Uh, and so what on the NDIA website right now, we're developing a page, it should be up shortly, uh, where we will have all this because we, we're not developing the model just to develop the model, right? The model is to get it out there. Yeah. So we've decided we're gonna make the mistakes with mm -hmm. these clients. Yeah. Everybody's, everybody's in agreement. We're yeah. going to make mistakes together. Right. We're going to get it out there as quickly as we can because it's an era where there was nothing to turn to. Yeah. H how, do you, how do you help somebody with digital issues remotely? Right. Like without, without giving them that, that reassurance. Yeah. And a lot of times it is, it is just really, it's hand-holding. Yes, yeah. you can do this. No, you're not going to break the computer. Right. It's totally fine. Let's talk that through for the fourth time. Mm -hmm. It's okay. I'm not upset. Yeah. You shouldn't be upset. Yeah. It's all good. Yeah. So having that kind of reassuring tone with mm -hmm. folks and being patient, mm -hmm. that's the thing that digital inclusion programs always did in person. Right. 
Exactly. And now it's, six, yeah. feet, oh, six feet away, maybe with a mask, yeah. maybe, maybe they're not coming in at all because mm -hmm. you can only fit four people in the building, you know, like depending on yeah. how your lab was, right. you know, be able to get very many people in there. It does highlight the, the challenge of that first mile digitally, like getting them into the Zoom room. Because if you can get yeah. them into Zoom from their home, which is why right. Zoom has had, Zoom's had a bit of a moment. I don't, I don't know if you oh. know it. Zoom, Zoom's been doing okay. So, but I think it's partly because, you know, even your, you know, your aging grandma, who you love, who you used to just talk to on the phone, you know, she might actually be able to get into Zoom from her mobile phone. And it depends, and it all depends right. on context, but it does seem like having more, more entry points into the digital ecosystem, so that people can actually get access to this from their home. But like, you can't, presume that like that first mile is almost the hardest i guess in a lot of ways yeah the the definition for we have two definitions on our website uh that we built when we first created ndia definition for digital equity and definition for digital inclusion mm -hmm. digital equity is the goal individuals and communities having access to information communication technologies for whatever they need to do yeah Digital inclusion is how we get there that digital inclusion definition included public access computers and yeah. internet Right. I don't talk about public access computers and internet anymore. In fact, right. I get a little angry when somebody wants to talk about parking lot Wi-Fi. Right. Unless it's in a rural area, do not tell me that is your solution. It right. might have been your solution in March because you didn't have time to come up with something else. But if you're in an urban area, yeah, it has got to be in people's homes. Right. Or, I mean, the, the, ag agreed. But the other thing that's been interesting is how outdoors is so much better. So even when you are thinking about just design of solution yes. spaces. You know, one of the, uh, there's a book that I, I'm trying to read <laughs> it's somewhere around here uh, about the redesign of school spaces in light of this. And, you know, I know yeah. you've, you've spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, libraries and community centers and, you know, agreed, like if, if folks are enabled from their homes, that, that'd be ideal if everyone could do it from their homes, but there is going to be this this rough period yes. which we're going to be in for a little while where to get people enabled from their homes they're probably going to need to interface either by phone or in uh some kind of physical space right? but mike I, th I think the difference in, in what we're saying is that yes what you're saying is that you need that physical space because you're going to need people need help mm -hmm. so how do you help them to be able to use what they need to use at home. Mm -hmm. The part, the piece I wanna make sure folks understand is that we can't say that a long-term solution mm -hmm. is public access mm -hmm. of the internet and of computers. Um, right, right. It was right. never a good- Regardless, answer. yeah. It was right. never a good answer before, right? For sure. Especially when we think about what we're using the internet for, mm -hmm. our taxes, Right. Telehealth appointments. Right. Are you really going to do a telehealth appointment right. in the library parking lot? Yeah, from or a anybody kiosk. can come yeah. by and hear yeah, about, yeah. or even yeah, like even what if you don't have a car and you're just sitting outside and everybody can hear you talking about whatever yeah, it is yeah. you're talking, that you don't really yeah. want to be able to hear. Sure. Or, and I have seen somebody do their taxes in a in a coffee shop before. Yeah. Which just feels really uncomfortable to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. It's just it. To me, everything keeps coming back to uh, empathy, you know, like just trying to understand what it's got to be like to be different from yourself, you know, like, because we're all different regardless of, of how many attributes we may share. But then trying to understand now, uh, it's really the thing that's been most profound for me in light of the pandemic is like my struggles, which is where is that Amazon delivery, you know, right. or am I disinfecting my, my Grubhub? effectively enough, you know, woe is me. Whereas other folks out there are so much more limited. You know, the idea of sheltering at home is a very, you know, if you don't really, if you don't really have a home even That's to right. live in, you can't- It's a shelter. privilege to yeah. shelter. Yeah, yeah. So, so anyway, I did want to try to look forward a little bit uh, from your perspective, because uh, right. I do think it's interesting to your previous point that digital inclusion, the awareness has been elevated and i think we all hope and pray that this uh, pandemic will be resolved somehow in the next say two or so years the awareness around digital inclusion will be elevated and hopefully there'll be an opportunity to continue to 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 run with this momentum so so how do you see 
you know, both the, the near term, like say like now through the, the run of this, this, this pandemic, which who knows how long that's going to be. And then maybe more on a, let's say like five year out kind of horizon. I'd love to get a little bit of both of those perspectives for you, cause, from you, because it's such an amazing time to be thinking about the future. And, and I just love getting perspectives of, from people who are really in the thick of it in different contexts. And the context you've been navigating is really complicated. And, you know, it is, it's really noble work you're doing too. So thanks again for, for what you and the team are, are doing. But I'd love to get some near term and maybe a little longer term perspective from you. Sure. The near term, I think, is about those partnerships. Mm -hmm. It's about more community members coming at this together. Mm -hmm. It's been really great to see digital equity funds being mm -hmm. set up at community foundations. Mm -hmm. In fact, so for example, there was a digital equity fund at the Cleveland Foundation that nobody was putting money in. Mm. They already had one. Mm. People are putting money in it now. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> so, um, yeah, yeah. so that kind of awareness is changing who the partners are. Hmm. Another great example from Cleveland is a corporation there. Because of the limited amount of devices out there available, so real quick, your listeners probably already know this. Chromebooks are way behind for being for delivery dates. There's just hard to find cheaper computers to get out there. And so one of the solutions is to refurbish computers locally. Mm -hmm. And a corporation in Cleveland has bought out their computer lease so that they can use those computers, have them refurbished get them oh, into homes. Nice, nice, yeah. Right, so that that was their solution. Mm -hmm. they, it was, they were scheduled to be shipped off, right? Mm -hmm. And they're like, forget it, don't, don't send these out. We right. need to keep these in town because mm -hmm. we don't have enough in our city and mm -hmm. we can't get them fast enough that wow. are new. Yeah. Huh. So those kinds of solutions Got are it. very yeah. local. Mm -hmm. uh, that happens because there's, there are those discussions and those relationships where folks are explaining, here's an exact problem that we have. We right. don't have it's, enough computers. Yeah, it's almost like the, the logistics around the PPEs that we heard so much yeah, about. Yeah, that's it's exactly a, right. Like, that's a perfect- Chromebooks are, are, are kind of like, they're, as, they're, they're becoming essential equipment yes. that needs to be managed in terms of pu both public health and education and probably a, a whole, a whole wealth of context I'm not even thinking of right now. And here's here's a wrinkle to that, and then we can get back to the solution thing. Here's yeah. a wrinkle to the um, not enough devices is that the devices that schools push out there to their students have a lot of security controls on them. Right. For good reason. Mm -hmm. But the result then is that after school programs and things that the parents need to do are not, you can't do them. Those aren't accessible on Got it. Mm -hmm. So what, what has happened is happening now is that those after school programs are going and buying additional machines. Mm -hmm. And then that child has two computers. Right. One they use for school stuff, mm -hmm. one they use for like, for after school yeah. programs. And normally like, okay, well, good for the child. Now they right. have two computers, but there's not enough computers out there. So right. one child could end up with two computers, another child could have no computer. Right, right, right. Right. So a lot of inefficiency, yeah. A lot yeah. of inefficiency, and it's, I'm, there's no blame here, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. Just that because of the way this has had to come up so quickly, so this is where that relationships between folks is really important, so mm -hmm. that the after-school program can say to the school, yeah, can you make our Zoom link an allowable yeah. email for your right. students? Mm -hmm. um, and for the parents to be able to have that relationship with the schools and the programs mm. that they're working with to say, here's what we're doing. Right. The parent doesn't have another device, but this device that you provide to the student is the only one in the household. Right, right. If they're going to apply for unemployment benefits and they can't do it on that computer, right. then it may not be happening. Right, right. So there has to be that communication, mm -hmm. uh, which only happens in places where those relationships exist mm -hmm. and, or where they're building them right now. That makes sense. Yeah. And that, I guess that's kind of the type of solutions that are, are being designed. It's going to yeah. be a lot of that MacGyver in a broom closet. Here's what you have. How do you figure out, Oh, good thing. There's some chewing gum. Cause like now we can actually get Wi-Fi to the, yeah, but I'm, I'm joking, yeah. but, uh, 
but it does feel like it's almost like the, we're in this resourceful, you need like the, the digitally competent Peace Corps, you know, to kind of like get out yeah. there and, and start sort of connecting the dots so that folks can navigate things. Is that, that kind of where you're Yeah, going? yeah. And it's, it's looking what you already have. So mm-hmm. San Antonio just released, uh, there was a news article yesterday about what they're doing. And the way they frame theirs is that they already had fiber for their streetlights because mm-hmm. they were heading there on the smart city path. Okay. So they're now using that fiber to get internet into kids' homes. Oh, wow. And, yeah. and they are targeting their, they're not, this isn't available to everybody. It's only students on the school network in low income neighborhoods. Wow. So that is how they deal with. So their electricity, is, like the, the way they're getting their electricity is how they're not getting Not about it. the electricity, no. It's, it's about, about the fiber. It's about, it's about traffic lights. So the traffic lights have, uh, and they're setting up mesh and wireless networks to go from the traffic lights into the kids' homes. Wow. That's some cool stuff. It is some cool stuff. And that is using what you already have. Yeah. Right. What do we have? Well, we have fiber for traffic lights. And yeah, one of the we've... jokes in the article was like, oh, now everybody wants smart traffic lights. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is. I mean, honestly, if you go through that looking glass too, like how do you get a traffic light in your neighborhood? You have... You have well-funded <laughs> homes with parents who know how to complain, but uh, that's a whole nother conversation. So, so a lot of, but like some, there is some hope, but there's a ton of work to be done. Really a uh, critical period to try to get some things right that we couldn't get right back in the spring. Is, is yes. that right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's totally accurate. And we are seeing some of these examples where you're like, wow, and yeah. it, you know, impressive. And then other times I'll talk to other affiliates where they're like, my city's doing nothing. Yeah. Right. So it really varies across the country, which means the inequality, right, is just yeah. intense that's out there. But but maybe there is a bit of a call to action for folks who have more time on their hands, who are digitally savvy to, to volunteer and try to pitch in. Because the good news is at least, I guess the good news is that you're not as localized in terms of your ability to deliver the help. Like you we should be able to centralize some yeah, of the expertise. But it is all, but yeah, we can centralize the expertise, but not the action. Mm-hmm, right. So the action has to be local. It needs to be locally funded and then delivered by locally. Well, and we're, work, we're working on federal funding. So okay. But still, that, yeah, people in the community have to do that. can't count on that though, right? Like yeah, we can right. only count on what's local. Right. And, and even there is some national interest from different organizations that want to help. But the more the more there's a plan in yeah. those localities, the more likely those national interests are to come in and help. Yeah. So for those listening, uh, checking with with what's ask ask the questions, right? Mm-hmm. What what are what is our plan? Who's working on it? Is anybody right. working on it? Right. And I would ask uh, local government folks, don't stop with just one person, right? Keep asking until you can get an answer. Mm. The local library, what are they doing? Mm-hmm. Because their resources are now all online. Right. right. So in my opinion, they are they are part of the leadership team. And this is happening in lots of places. We're seeing it where they are part of the leadership team that's figuring out how to get access into people's homes. Mm-hmm. Not just for the students, but because the libraries yeah. have their resources and you can't access them if you don't have internet at home. Yeah. I happen um, to be I happen to be married to a librarian. So you're oh, you're speaking you're speaking my language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ex- ex- uh, excellent. Yeah. Uh, so then I think it's also those community based organizations, any low income housing property owners and mm-hmm. housing authorities. This is who we're seeing in the mix now, right? Mm-hmm. We're seeing community-based organizations that are already connected. We're seeing a huge interest among those that serve immigrant populations mm-hmm. that hadn't been doing digital inclusion work before and are now all of a sudden in a situation where they have to do it. Mm-hmm. And it really has to be them because mm-hmm. it's, that's the whole trusted piece of it, yeah. right? Who is who has the the least trust out there for anybody? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. New new folks to the country, right? Right, right, right. This is a scary time for them. Right. In the United sure. States. Yeah. So the the organizations that serve them now all of a sudden find them in a place where they are serving as their just digital navigators, but they had no prep to do it. Uh huh. Wow. Yeah. So so having those figuring out asking everybody in town. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the questions to ask is, uh, where is our local government's CARES Act money going? Mm-hmm. 
Right. Is any of it going to buy devices? Is any of it going to buy connectivity? Mm -hmm, it should be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How about the CARES Act money that the school district got? Is any of that going to connectivity or devices? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's some real, real talk stuff that folks can do now to begin to feel like they're part of the solution here. Yes. Uh, in addition to just elevating awareness, ask the questions, that's talk right. to your friends, let other people know, remind them, even if it seems obvious, you know, there's awareness of the problem, but the, that's still not a solution. So like until we feel like we're in a good place, which is probably going to be maybe never, but at least pandemic wise, you know, it's probably right through the run of the pandemic, there's going to be a hard fight, at least for the next year, year or two years to try to manage the public health access, social distancing, right. di digital, non-digital, all that stuff. One of the things that we can talk about, I think, is what the internet service providers are doing. Mm and the length of time that those contracts are being brokered for. Mm. Uh, we're seeing it with uh, local governments, house, community-based organizations, housing authorities, and school districts are negotiating with internet service providers for bulk purchases. Mm -hmm. So they'll say, okay, we're gonna, we wanna purchase you know, 2,000 accounts. Uh, we're gonna pay directly for those accounts. And then there is an entity, whether it might be the school district, it might be a community-based organization, somebody is then the one that, that helps that household receive that free internet that's being paid for elsewhere. Mm -hmm. What we're seeing right now is that Comcast is doing it at $10 per month. Sometimes they throw in a couple extra months, depending upon who they're negotiating with. Mm -hmm. We're seeing Cox is about the same. We're seeing... T-Mobile and AT&T offering a wireless plans for $20 a month, no data cap. Mm. AT&T so far, haven't heard of any wireline deals, meaning their DSL or fiber, mm, mm. which is unfortunate because those hotspot, most mobile hotspot solutions have a, about an $85 charge for the hotspot. Oh, wow. So those yeah. are not cheap solutions in the long run because mm -hmm. um, your long run, right, is also part of the question. Is it 12 months? Right. Six months? Is it two years? T-Mobile asks for a two-year commitment. Mm -hmm. uh, get them to negotiate that down because that's too, that's too much. Because mm -hmm. uh, who knows what this is going to look like. Right, right. And then Charter's deal is $30 a month. Mm -hmm. Everybody who has contacts with Charter, tell them that is not acceptable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Comcast and Cox are coming in at 10 and they're coming in at 30. Right, right. This is a pandemic for God's sake. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is not time to make a profit. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah. And then, but then on the other side, where do you see this heading? So let's, let's, you know, hope and pray we get through the pandemic and, you know, things settle down eventually and folks start coming back to whatever the new normal is. You know, we talk a lot about on this show how the new normal will likely in include online learning, likely include telehealth, more working from home. I imagine those are some of the trends you're also uh, tracking on your end, but, but how do you envision sort of the evolution of the digital inclusion movement, you know, broader awareness, like what happens, what happens next? Digital inclusion practitioners like to talk about this genie not going back into the bottle. Mm -hmm. Will we, a year from now, if we're able to get the pandemic under control, be like, yeah, kids can go to the library. Yeah, you can go to the McDonald's. Mm -hmm. No, like we have got to keep that from happening. Yeah. And, and I think we're, the awareness is such that I feel hopeful that we won't go back to that, but also resources are already pretty thin and yeah. strapped. So in a, in a world of limited resources, there will be some places that yes, that is exactly what they go back to right. is public access. And so then that continues to exacerbate our digital divides, mm -hmm. which as you mentioned earlier, really lay across bigger, broader equity issues. Right. 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 Like the, the digital divide is a thing that impacts all the other equity issues and is impacted by the other equity issues. Yeah. We, so we have to take care of it as yeah. one of the equity issues that we must be addressing. And it does feel like it's one that is solvable if you throw money at it, which is not a bad thing. You know, like it just the, the scale of the spend that would be needed to solve this is, is, is enormous. But I also know there's, you know, five or so CEOs who've been testifying before Congress recently who, who could probably in the in the cushions of their sofas on their their dormant campuses could could scrap together some funding to start to solve some of these problems. 
but uh, but it but it is a place where you know if you do start thinking longer term you know almost like a, like a, like access to electricity access to uh clean water you know something that we're still still trying to get to the the 99th percentile maybe in some places but we're we're, we're pretty close to getting that to be universal maybe this is an opportunity through real work you know it's not like people aren't going to have to con- make these connections and move the ball forward and you know call their local governments and get activated but like it does seem like there is a broader arc towards connectivity uh, that that probably is you know helps give folks like yourself a little bit of hope when you're in there and it's kind of dire and it's you know the day to day can get kind of rough i imagine the uh, the pot- the potential for long term solutions are feel more possible to me than ever before mm-hmm. so there there is a proposed broadband benefit being discussed mm-hmm. in dc this mm-hmm. would be a subsidy for low income households and those who recently lost income to pay for their internet yep. or a portion of their internet mm-hmm. that has not been a an actual discussion mm-hmm. in dc prior to the pandemic right Right. So, yes, I think the understanding that the internet is an essential service mm-hmm. and we have to make sure of it, but it's in everybody's homes, is influencing public policy right now. We're seeing mm-hmm. that happening at the local level, at the state level, at the federal level. At the local level, we're seeing not only those activities that we just dis- discussed, but we're seeing a little bit of the pushing of some of the policies that have been barriers in the past. Mm-hmm. So they're doing it super cautiously, but mm-hmm. I'm fascinating that it is still ha- that it, they are pushing it in their gentle way. It's, mm-hmm. it's happening. And then at the federal level, there are more groups advocating for this broadband benefit, advocating for funds for E-rate to help cover costs to go into the home mm-hmm. or a change in policy so that the E-rate can be used to be covered internet and devices in the home. Mm-hmm. All of that is happening now and it wasn't happening before. So right. that whole genie in the bottle business, can we continue to keep working on those post pandemic? Mm-hmm. Again, we're just gonna assume there will in fact be a post pandemic. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So Angela, always amazing to get your time. I know I know it's scarce, so I definitely appreciate it. Our listeners appreciate I always probably get as much response from the shows we've done with you as any of the topics that we've covered. So clearly you're onto something. Our listeners are, are certainly responding, which is awesome. Any final thoughts uh, as we wrap up here? I am very hopeful. Right. Like I am working way too much, right? But but it's because I believe in it. Mm -hmm. I believe we can get there. I believe we are making progress. And the folks that we work with on the ground are so inspirational, the way that they are coming up with solutions that even though it feels daunting right now, I think it is in fact a bright spot. Awesome. Ending on a high note, always a good way to go. Angela Seifer, the executive director of the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. Uh, Digitalinclusion.org is where you can find all this information. Really a wonderful organization. Lots of people are really trying to make a difference. Thanks again for joining and uh, thanks everyone for listening. (laughs) 